which, which you know, is a relatively new field until, well, until the 1960s in psychology, you weren't even allowed to think that people thought. It wasn't until the cognitive revolution that psychologists were willing to think that people thought and that maybe animals did. I mean, everyone else on the bloody planet knew that people thought, but the psychologists were refusing to admit it. And that was because they were using strictly behavioral propositions in their lab work, and there was some real utility in that. And the cognitive scientists came along in the early 1960s and said, well, hold on a minute, we're not just stimulus response machines, even though there are levels of analysis at which we are. And then it wasn't until much later, 40 years later really, 30 years later, a lot as a consequence of the influence of Russian neuropsychologists, as it turns out, that it became self-evident that, well, yeah, yeah, cog cognition, but, you know, what about emotion, and what about motivation, and, you know, can we actually study those as biological properties, and the answer to that turned out to be, oh yeah, we certainly could, and not only that, that it's obviously, it's obvious that our higher order cognitive functions are nested within fundamental emotional and motivational systems, and it's also obvious who's in charge, and it's not the higher order cognitive functions, unless you're blindly naive, you know, if, even if you look at the brain from a neuroanatomical perspective, the strength of the projections reaching up from the base of your brain, from places like the hypothalamus, which is the ground of fundamental motivational systems like aggression and sexuality, those are like tree trunks. The little tendrils coming down from the top of your brain that, that do the regulation, you know, the conscious regulation, those are like little vines, you know. So, as long as you're reasonably satiated and everything's under control, you can pretend that your rational mind is running the show. But when push comes to shove, it's like, well, no. You know, and it's also pretty obvious that you don't even really like it when your rational mind is under control too much, because, and this is again a reflection of the superego versus ego dichotomy, is you're always running around, you know, consuming great amounts of alcohol and other sorts of, um, you know, consciousness altering substances, which usually alter it for the worse, so to speak, so that you can do impulsive and crazy and idiotic things that are really, really entertaining and fun. So, we don't want to forget about who's in charge. And Freud was, and, and still is, a very good corrective for people who are convinced that their rational intellect is the fundamental element of their being. Now, the, the, the creative illness that, that Jones talked about, and that Henri Alberge talked about, is a variant of the initiation process that we've been describing. And one of the things that um, people like Alain Berger pointed out is that it's often the case that people who make great discoveries go through a protracted period of chaos while they're making their discoveries before they put the discoveries together. And that happened to Darwin, for example. You know, because Darwin per knew perfectly well. You know, he's a pretty straight-laced Englishman, old Darwin. He knew perfectly well that he was lighting a bomb. It was a big bomb. I mean, I think you could safely say that Darwin was the most revolutionary scientist who ever lived. You know, when I was growing up, it seemed to be Einstein. But the old Darwin, man, he's, he's, making a, he's making his move. And it's especially the case because Darwin not only outlined natural selection, which, you know, kept biologists busy for a whole hundred years, but he also outlined sexual selection, and all the biologists ignored that for a hundred years, and they're coming back to it now. So, that was hard on old Darwin, because he knew that the world was going to go from 8,000 years old and created by God to God only knows how long, and the consequence of somewhat random biological processes. I mean, that's a major league shift in the old world view, and, you know, so to the degree that Darwin... Darwin's personality was structured both explicitly and implicitly by um, Protestant religious presuppositions, which it was, because in many ways he was a conventional person. You know, he was taking a mighty axe to the basic trunk of his, the, to the thick trunk of his being. You know, and he suffered for that. He had anxiety disorders, and it's no bloody wonder, you know. I mean, if you were Darwin and you weren't nervous, you wouldn't have had any idea what you were launching on the world. It was a massive revolution. You know, and Freud's notion that we were deeply embedded in our animal selves, also was, was the precursor to having people start to comprehend themselves, not in terms of, you know, the last 
hundred years of history, or the last five hundred years of history, or maybe even the entire five thousand years of recorded history, but the seven million years since we've been separated from our common ancestor with chimps, and the sixty million years since we were living in trees, and the two hundred and twenty million years since there were mammals, and the four hundred million years when our ancestors were basically lobsters and that's a completely different way of thinking about the world and like it's something that we haven't digested yet and I would say for, Freud was in the forefront of the, of the revolution that produced that transformation in thinking it was also hard on Freud and that's what Jones is pointing out, you know, I mean Freud was definitely an anti-religious destroyer like Nietzsche, you know, he was another announcer of the death of God and Freud's idea about religion was that it was a defense anxiety against death a de sorry, a defense mechanism against death anxiety you know, and to the degree that you guys are being taught terror management theory, for example, it's like that's Freud, straight and simple, I mean, terror management theory was developed by Ernest Becker and Ernest Becker was a psychoanalyst, even though he was a soci sociologist and he wrote the denial of death in an attempt to update Freudian presuppositions so, Freud is by no means dead and the idea of the associations, you know, that people, people's thinking is associational and that the associations are actually linked together by emotional similarity it's like, well the implicit attitudes all of the implicit attitudes research is predicated on that idea they don't ever credit Freud with it, but it was Freud's initial discovery, you know, he discovered that that people's thoughts wandered in a sense, you know and that you could, you could see why they wandered if you paid attention, you could track the underlying rationale for the connection between sets of disparate ideas by paying close attention and you could interpret them and that's really what he did with free association and, you know, I would say that I don't really think Freud discovered free association I think what he did is observe that many of his severely damaged clients who I think would have had some variant of borderline personality disorder if we would have seen them today if you just let them talk, they would free associate and what that was in some sense, it was, the, it was the consequence of the fact that their personalities had never really been organized and maybe that's because no one had ever listened to them you know, so I can tell you, as far as I can see, that people organize their personalities by talking and if you don't have someone to listen, it's like, well, you've got all these ideas rattling around in your head that are basically rooted in emotion and they're not linked together by any coherent narrative and they're not pruned, that's another thing you need other people to say, you know, that's a really stupid way of looking at things you know, and if you don't have that, well then especially if you've got a reasonably creative mind, you're going to generate a whole mass of counterproductive you know, but, but, but potentially founded ideas that you just can't cull so